CS-115, we, we look at it as an applicable thing to most all the agencies. It's a bulk cable injection and impulse. It's applicable to all services except ships and subs. And the standard, the mill standard, 461, tells you where the applicable is. Come on in. And this test is accomplished on the I.O. cables, power cables, and that includes the returns and ground. It's always been a dilemma of, does it include returns and ground and excluding other wires? And power leads grouped, and excluding the things. Now, I put the word grouped in there because the standard says power leads. The implication is the group. However, a lot of people test with power leads individually. So three phase power, they do phase A, then phase B and phase C. That's not what it says. It says power leads. So if when I see an ABC that says the author of that, or whoever did the test, didn't quite read the book, okay? So it's a, it tends to be a group. Why? Well, because this is cable coupled problem. And so the ABC wiring all tends to route together. So if I'm adjacent to a coupling issue, it's going to couple onto all of them. So it tends to make good sense to do that. So we, we look at that. Also, is power leads excluding at this, including the returns and ground and excluding other wires. What happens to shielded cables? Most every lab in the world splits the shield out to get access to the cables, much like I have here, but you don't do that on shielded cables because the standard says it is not the intent to disrupt the shield to get to core wiring. So if it truly is a shielded power cable, you leave the shield intact and forget that group. You don't do the phase lead, you don't do this, you do the group, the bundle. However, 461F publication says shielded power cables do not exist. Then in Appendix A, they tell you how to deal with shielded power cables, okay? So if you're confused, it is. There are some cases where a shielded power cable might come into play. If it's truly there, then you leave it intact for the test. If you don't have it, 461, it's a commodity. Everything's supposed to fit. Things really don't. Shielded power cables come into play when you have a product that's furnishing power to you, and you say, I'm doing the filtering, and you say, I need a shield to protect me. That's legit, because it's one system. That's the way it's wired. Okay? But in general, we want to look at it, I'm plugging this into somewhere. So the mains are not shielded once it gets into the wall, once it gets anywhere. So take them away because you don't really have control. There's a common limit for all the applications that says basically five amps. And it, it's, your test is accomplished at a drive level. Fundamentally, we're going to do a calibration here and do this. So the five amps is the test current for the calibration jig. The calibration jig is a open coax. So I'm bringing a coaxial cable in and I'm terminating it with a dummy load. So I have this system here and this forms my coaxial body, the open coax. So the current injection probe goes under there for Cal. Okay. Now be aware that calibration current and test current may not be the same thing. In this case, I calibrate to this, I know what my settings are, and I play that setting back to the cable. If I happen to be injecting 45 amps, well, so be it. If I happen to be injecting one amp, so be it. That's what it is. You pre-calibrate and set that level, drive it. Now, we're also going to do CS116, and it's not the same way at all. Okay? So let's uh, kind of go forward with that. The CS115 waveform is much like this. The standard calls for that waveform with critical less than two nanoseconds rise and fall times and a 30, second, 30 nanosecond minimum pulse width. Minimum, okay? So it's not an exacting kind of thing. They also show in the appendix this type of waveform. When you use a broadband current probe, you may get this very activity. Okay, it may look just like that. It. It's a perfectly acceptable waveform. So we're going to say that's the calibrations. 
And then during the pretest, I'm going to do something like this, take the pulse generator into a current injection probe to my calibration jig that we have one here, set an attenuator and the oscilloscope based on a 50 ohm termination. So I need to calibrate that. Now in this particular system, the HV technology system, they provide the terminations. So the scope just connects, it's already got its 50 ohm termination, it's built in, the attenuators are there. So I don't have to worry about my scope doing this. If you use a non-loaded here termination, if you use the oscilloscope as your termination, be aware you're injecting five amps, 50 ohms is how many watts, and the terminator of the scope's a 10th watt. It may or may not live. If it lives through this because of the short duration pulse, it won't live through CS116. So you will wreck the 50 ohm terminator of the scope. So you need a termination with enough power to dissipate. Do I need 5,000 watts dissipation? No, I have a one second duration, low duty cycle, continuous power. I need a peak attenuator, but it'll usually a five watt attenuator is more than enough, even though you're doing 2,500 watts or better because of the low duty cycle. So, but be aware, you do need to get this termination in place somehow whether it be through the manufacturer's parts or your own, okay, however system you use. Um, the calibration process, well, we just seen how we're gonna hook it up. We need an external 50 ohm terminator. You set the generator and repeat and adjust the amplitude to the measured level. You have to look for gains and losses, attenuators, and et cetera. I enjoy their, they have an attenuator as part of the kit a little 20 dB attenuator, okay? Well, now what does 20 dB tell us? One decimal place. 20 log, so it's a decimal place when I do a 20 dB in current and voltage. So if it's 20 log function, 20 dB means I just shift a decimal place. So instead of one amp, a tenth amp. I got it. So nice, easy, convenient things for 20s and 40s and things. It's just decimal places every 20. So it's you get that in your head, you're not doing this math over and over again. So you just kind of do that. You need to verify the waveform, its pulse width, transition times, and record all that information. So let's do this, okay? Okay, now remember when you're installing these things, you're building the coaxial piece. So keeping these plates and everything in play needs to happen, okay? Kind of watch for this. This center conductor has got sharp points on the ends, okay? And so you need to be able to spin this inductor, but it shouldn't wobble. You shouldn't feel any motion side to side because it's indicating you got a loose connection and when you get to higher frequencies, it'll destroy the waveforms, okay? Really plays havoc with it. So realize I've got a very sharp point, so the spin is good, but wobble is no good, okay? So we do this, we install our terminator, I mean our current injection probe. I'm going to connect the cable to this thing. And this particular probe for 115 uses a bridging circuit. 116 it comes out. So I'll install it. I didn't set it up very nicely here. I got it crooked. Okay, I've got that installed. So all I should have to do is plug in my CS115 module, see that it recognizes it. It does. And I should be able to press enter. And it tells me I'm adjusting to five amps, which I can adjust the amplitude if I want a different current like uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission does this test at two amps, okay? So you might need to adjust things based on the standard that you're working with. We plug that in, and before I was setting up, I did check this. 
And all I should have to do is turn this thing on. And it's adjusting the pulse. I need to adjust my time scale. So now I have my waveform. And I should have the pulse and And I should be able to go upstairs and see this this waveform and adjust expand the waveform to look at the parameters. Okay, it should be five amps. They calibrate so it's a decimal place away. So <clears throat> five volts should be five amps. And by the way, this comes with their calibration records. Okay. So it's always there. We can verify the waveform is present. Go to two, I've got two and a half divisions. My waveform is there. I can use the cursors to adjust at the time is less than two nanoseconds from the 10% to 50% point. Durations 30 or more, slightly more. This one measured out at 34, etc. So I have this waveform calibration now. So I've done my cal check, okay? The setting here says I set this thing for a five amp output, I'm ready to go, okay? So now I should just stop the pulse. All I should have to do is move the probe to the cable, okay? Okay, it says for me to do the power cable as a bundle, okay? And it says the test configuration, okay? I now have I hate to do this. This injection probe, I have the pulse generator that I've calibrated the cable feeding it, the injection probe, and I have a monitoring probe to measure how much current is going into my test article. Now, I, I do want to point out, be very careful of your test setups, okay? The mill standard configuration says for you to place the cables five centimeters above a ground plane for two meters of cable length, et cetera power cables two and a half meters to the lizen, longer cables are set up. Be aware of that, we've got a very high frequency pulse. Now I don't have a ground plane here, I didn't want to ship this big sheet of copper, but the idea is that when I start injecting signal here, I have a loop of current being made. So I have to inject into my probe, into the test article, through the ground system, wherever it is, back through the network and back in. I've got a loop current, okay? The ground plane affects where that is, okay? And starts charting it out. Because of the two five centimeter cable, this test cable will affect that height. So if I get down close to a ground plane, I will produce more current at the high frequency because I have a shorter loop because of parasitic capacitance along the cable. If I elevate it or have no ground plane, much more current, much less current flowing. So pay attention to the setups. Why do we have the setup like that? So you get the same result as you get, okay? We all should get the same answer, okay? That's ideal. So we, we set this thing up. I'm supposed to be five centimeters from the unit. I need to put my cable in place, okay? And the injection signal. comes back to here. So I've connected the injection signal to the probe. I have that set. All right, so I have the injection probe doing this. I have the monitoring probe now fed to my oscilloscope. And the oscilloscope now needs to be on 50 ohms, OK? Because before, I had this attenuator do it. Now I don't. And that scope is calibrated based on a 50 ohm termination. They feed spectrum analyzers and the like. So I gotta pay attention to where I'm terminating, okay? That probe's measurements depend on a 50 ohm termination. If I fail to supply it, I get the wrong answer, okay? So be aware of those things. Jim looks quizzical and says, how do you know which one, when to do that? Well, it's part of the standard. You look at the terminations. Your instrumentation will tell you that, sco that current probe was calibrated for a 50 ohm termination. Its cal is only valid when I do that. So you have to pay attention to those very elements. I can't point myself to that speaker, that's for sure. Okay, uh, scope, 50 ohms. 
I set a 50 ohm termination in the scope. Let me go back to that. So I've got the 50 ohm, and we know that because the ohm symbol is turned on. Okay, so we know we have a 50 ohm termination. And I repeat that test. I'm supposed to do this test at the repetition rate, 30 hertz or more, for a minute. Okay, so I simply turn it on, I set the duration for a minute, and I fire the pulse. Now that nice waveform we had, that nice square wave, what's happened to it? The cable. That's not a 50 ohm cable. That's something else. Also, let's look at the level. 200 millivolts, I need to interpret that somehow. Okay? I need to know what voltage translates into current. And I use a spreadsheet to do I use a spreadsheet to do that with. By the way, this is a, a spreadsheet we put together just to capture data. <clears throat> so I need to know what the monitoring probe factor is. And I need to input this. I checked with the manufacturer, his is zero at this frequency. And by the way, what frequency do we use? This is a pulse. We base our frequency based on the pulse width and the reciprocal of it. Rise time. Somewhere in between, the standard don't tell you. So you got to decide how you're going to handle it. Where's the energy? The energy's in the duration. So I always use that as my measurement point. To say I'm going to use a factor based on the reciprocal of the pulse width. Okay, one over t to get me the time, the frequency that I'm going to use the calibration for. Is it right? Well, I don't know. I've been doing it a lot of years and nobody's complained because they didn't give me a better idea. So we're going to do it that way. You need to define how you do it. Write it in your report so this guy understands it. Well, you understand it. This is what they did. So you can repeat that. So we have a zero factor. And now all I need to do is measure this amplitude. I have 200 millivolts for division and I have one, two, three, four divisions. 4 times 200, 800 millivolts. So I put with a zero factor, 0.8 volts, 0.8. And if I had an attenuator in the current probe line, if I had very high currents, I may need an attenuation just to see it well. I put that in. So it says that based on this reduction, I'm injecting 1.9 amps. So I measure the peak current. Convert it back into a voltage, by the way, it's uh, nothing magic about the equations. It's just simple log functions going on to add the factors and attenuations and et cetera to convert volts to amps. So we do that and determine if it's there. Susceptibility indication. On our worksheet, I want to record something because a blank says nothing. None says something. No errors says something. A blank says, did you look? Because right now my test article is being evaluated. Pass fail says that test article worked. It did not get upset during the events. I applied the pulse for the duration. It lasted. It made everything happy. Okay. So 115 is just that easy. Okay. If we make it hard, that's a problem. So now Jim looks at me and says, so how long do you bid this job for? Okay. How long is it going to take you in the lab? You got a unit with 10 cables. Well, that's 10 minute minimum. Then you got to connect them, so let's make it 12 minutes to do 10 cables. Now we got a calibration and add 10 more for that. So we're talking about 10 cables in less than an hour. Okay? In your lab time, you don't do anything in an hour. You don't find the equipment and hook it up and get it running and the UT checked out and your documentation and all that. So usually almost any task is three to four hours just to keep the records right. You gotta keep good records, okay? Records are the key. What am I doing here? This worksheet happens to be something we use because we, we elaborate on it, we do the math, number one, so we get the math right so nobody's getting math errors kicked in on us. I put a reference sheet to remind us how to do this job. So it's a procedure built in 
our calibration records, did we check everything, what was our settings, et cetera, and a way for us to record what equipment we used, okay? Now, in the lab, we do it differently. We got more automation and things like that, but I'm going out, out in the field someplace. I mean, in, and I mean actually in the field, you know? We're out here in a parking lot someplace working on a pro project, and I don't have a network connection hanging out there four miles from anywhere, you know? You know, it's, it's amazing the sites you can locate. A year ago, or less than a year ago, I was in an abandoned tunnel on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. The company got access so they could put a large machine inside this tunnel a mile into the mountain, and we battery powered with an inverter test equipment so we could meet a mill standard specification in the tunnel. Okay? It was great. Only thing about it is in March, Pennsylvania winds come through a coal tunnel with an ice cube sitting beside you, you know you're going to freeze in an hour. <laughs> but you do these things. By the way, the LED flashlight was 10 meters away from the antenna and it interfered. We couldn't even have our flashlights on. Okay? It was that quiet in there. So anyway, you need a way to record what you got going on. CS 115 in a nutshell, if we go back to the, uh, okay, it says there, connect the system. Notice I got something in red up there. Maintain the same equipment as used for calibration. Well, those are new words that came out in Mill Standard 461F. So I guess someone in 461E would cal this set and test with that set. I don't know. To me, <laughs> that was an implication, but it's, it's real. You apply it for the specified period, re monitor the UT, record the applied current, obtain a waveform, etc. Verify if you determine thresh, thre susceptibility, you got to do a threshold. What's a threshold? At what point does the unit become susceptible? If the test was a calibrated 5 amps, and I'm injecting 1.92 amps, that's what this particular cable happened, 1.92, and it failed. I need to reduce the applied current until it becomes good, reduce it six more dB, and six dB means half the current, so I just cut it in half again, and then elevate it until it's susceptible. At that point of susceptibility is where the threshold is. Okay? At the threshold, you need to maintain test for the minute or the duration, because what if it starts heating and failing? So you maintain the test period at the threshold level for the time period. And that's it. <clears throat> Tabular recording, by the way, now I've got this dilemma. I've got to be able to adjust the current to do that. So now I've got to set a different current level than he had, even though I calibrated it five amps. All right, so I've got a five amp calibration. Now I need to set a current that's different than five, so I adjust it to three. It still fails, I adjust it to one, it fa it's okay. I adjust it till I find it. So I find that point, get my threshold, and then I've got to go back to the cal rig to determine what the cal was, okay? Now I've got my new setting. What was that in the cal jig? So I have to backtrack to get the numbers and threshold, okay? That, that data is important for somebody who needs to fix it. How bad a problem is it? Is it a 6 dB problem or a 40 dB problem, okay? We need to look at that. Uh, how about testing with a negative pulse? In the setup here, they've got a positive and negative. There's no requirement to test with a positive and negative. Okay? Just a pulse. I'm getting transitions both ways. But they put a negative on because if I install this probe this direction, that scope would look down. It'd be a negative looking waveform that I have showing up here. So the negative waveform, people don't like the looks of that, so they just invert it with the machine yeah, instead yeah, of turning yeah. the probe around. Okay? Sometimes it's very difficult to rotate the probe to get there. If the power cable is shielded, then you need to remove it. It doesn't say that. Some places insist you have to get to core wiring. But if it's truly a shielded cable, I say the standard says that's not the intent, so we don't do it. Can you use a 10x scope in place of the attenuator? No. The 10x scope's not 50 ohms, so you set 50 ohms on the scope, your attenuator is already built into your probe that's now high impedance. So a 10x probe don't work. You've got to use an attenuator, 50 ohm termination. So that's CS115.